15 million, actually. Smart. Get the right numbers in there. Um, actually, to be honest with you, nobody could have been more surprised that the, the TED Talk had that many conversations, had that many views than me. Like, I was literally the most surprised person by that. Because when they asked me to do that TED Talk, the prompt that they gave me was, um, think of something that's going wrong in the world that bothers you, and then tell us how to fix it. Uh, and I said, okay, well, what's bothering me is that we're not actually having real conversations anymore. And I happen to know how to fix that. <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty boring topic. I didn't cut my hair or put on makeup. Um, and then it got 13 million views, so. <laughs> um, and I am going to tell you how to have better conversations today. But really, my goal is to teach you, to convince you to stop using email. And I have 44 minutes and 8 seconds. And by the time that's over, I'm going to have convinced you guys to use at least 50% less email than you're using right now. And I realize that you're all going, yeah, absolutely. But in the back of your head, you're like, no, <laughs> that's not happening because email is how I live. Um, and I get that. I totally get that. But just give me 30, 43 minutes and 42 seconds. Um, the first thing that I have to do Always, always, every time I speak on this subject, and this is anywhere in the entire world, this is not just an American problem, is to convince you that you actually need help in this area. Um, because the number one question that I get everywhere is some version of, how do I change what somebody else, the way somebody else talks to me? Um, it's how do I get them to stop interrupting me? How do I get them to stop for stop running on and on and on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's good news and there's bad news, right? The bad news is you can't. There is nothing you can do to change the way someone else talks to you. I'm going to move this further from my mouth because I'm loud. The good news is you have 100% control over what you do. And the further good news is you probably need the improvement. And this is a difficult message for me to, to deliver because it turns out that the smarter you are, the more likely you are to be bad in conversation. That's, that's just the truth. So that's the way Thomas Jefferson says it. And this is a little bit confusing because he says, he who knows best, best knows how little he knows, right? What he's saying is he who knows the most actually is the person most likely to know how little that is. And it turns out, hundreds of years later, that science backs him up. And when I say that, I just want to tell you about a little study by, done by Justin, uh, Dunning, Justin Kruger and David Dunning. And they were trying to figure out how to train people better. And they were having a tough time. So they started trying to figure out how well we are actually able to estimate what we know or what we don't know. So they would bring in hundreds, in the end, I think it was thousands of participants. And they would have them take tests in lots of different things. It wasn't just like math. Some of it was humor. And then when they were done with the test, they would quiz them in how well do you think you did, which questions do you think you missed, and how well do you think you did in comparison to everybody else. So here's the thing. The more incompetent you were in the subject, the more likely you were to say you were above average. It turns out that the exact same expertise you need to know how little you know is the expertise that you need to know that you don't know anything. Now, on the flip side of that, people who did really well also underestimated how well they did in comparison, but the reason for that was they assumed everyone else had done about as well as they did. They knew which questions they missed. They just thought they were average. But people, even in the eighth percentile, thought that they were above average. So this is the problem. And it's kind of the problem with conversation. Because all the research that we have shows that we all tend to vastly overestimate our conversational skills and vastly underestimate everyone else's conversational skills. Now, one of the reasons for this is that we're not actually getting a lot of practice at it. And by that, I mean we're getting a ton of practice at talking, but we're not actually getting a lot of practice at conversing anymore. We tend to avoid small talk every chance we can. 
right? You bury your head in your phone so the Uber driver doesn't make eye contact and start talking to you. You get in the elevator and you pretend you're there by yourself or you have a really tight smile and go, hi, how you doing? Right? We avoid small talk as much as we possibly can. And that's especially true at work. We don't want to get involved and we think of it... <laughs> we think of it... These are real tweets. We think of it as a waste of time. So, one of the things I can tell you is that even though it feels like a waste of time, one of my friends drove around the block twice because he saw his neighbor out front taking out his garbage cans and he didn't want to get caught into a conversation. I mean, we can laugh at that, but we all do some version of that. Most of us do. But here's the thing. Small talk, those little chit-chats you have that are just about nothing, is really good for you. And I mean really good for you. People who chat with their neighbors live longer, they're less likely to have a serious cardiac, cardiac event within the next 10 years, they're less likely to suffer from depression, they're less likely to suffer from diabetes. People who have regular small talks with strangers share many of the same benefits. They're better physically, they're healthier mentally. So why do we avoid it? And the average American adult spends about 30 minutes texting every day and only about six minutes on the phone. And in fact, I think that, that research is about three years old and I would bet it's worse than that right now. Some companies, I mean big companies like Coca-Cola, JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Cisco Systems, they use, vo they use the phone so little they've just eliminated voicemail from their phones. They don't pay for it anymore, it's gone. Because it's not used anymore. And we're doing ourselves actual harm <laughs> by avoiding small talks and conversations. Now, one of the reasons is a very human reason for that. And that is because talking about ourselves and talking about the things that we know feels really good. And this comes, this, the, the, one of the first light bulbs for me in my research came from this, this research out of uh, Harvard that was published in 2014. And they discovered that the, the act of what they call self-disclosure, that really just means talking about yourself, it gives you the same pleasure, it activates the same pleasure center in your brain as sex and heroin. It's inherently pleasurable. Now, I want to take this even further, because the participants in this study, how many of you have seen an MRI, right? Seen an MRI, you know how big they are. When you're in an MRI, they put you down on the cold thing and they put you inside a thing. So these people chose, first of all, chose a lower salary. They chose to be paid less for their time in order to continue talking about themselves. And because they were in an MRI machine, they had no idea if there was anyone else in the room. Think about this for just a second. They may have been talking about themselves to an empty room for all they knew, but they still chose to be paid less. That is how inherently pleasurable it is for us to talk about ourselves. Everybody, that is a human thing. But sadly, it kind of messes, it messes with our estimation of how well conversations go. Because let's say you had a really great, what you thought was a fantastic job interview and you got out of it feeling awesome, and you're like, I'm gonna get that job, and then you didn't, or like a, a date, and you were like, oh man, we really connected because you feel great and you feel pumped up, right? And then she or he never call you again. That's because the little pleasure thing is in your brain every time you talk about yourself going and you feel awesome and they don't have that same experience. This is one of the reasons why we're not that great at estimating how good we are in conversations. And how bad is it? It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad at this point. It's happened a little bit gradually, so maybe we haven't realized how, how much the t amount of time that we spend talking to each other is, how low that has gone. But at this point, the United Nations says that more people have access to a cell phone than have access to working toilets in the world. And very few people, in the developed world at least, actually use those cell phones to make calls. 
we use them to text and we use them to email. How many of you regularly answer email in your off hours? It's okay, you can raise your hand, I'm not gonna yell at you. It's more than that, I know the statistics. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you, at this point, don't even think anything of it? It's not even a special thing when you answer email in your off hours, right? Like, we've seen all the 1960s and 70s shows where the dad says, oh, I'm bringing my work home with me tonight, Martha, sorry about that. We don't even mention it anymore. Like, that's what we do. That's how we communicate with each other. But here's the problem with all of the ways in which we have replaced regular human conversation. And by that I mean face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice -voice conversation. The problem with that is that we as human beings need face-to-face -face and voice-to-voice -voice conversation. That's how the human race functions. And over the past 30 years, empathy has dropped by 40%. And almost all of that has occurred since the year 2000. Now, empathy may be one of those soft skills that people don't like to talk about, or they grimace when you say you're going to uh, address that in your training. But the thing is, empathy is not something just Mr. Rogers would talk to kids about. Empathy is literally one of the main reasons the human race has survived on this planet. because. We're all not, that, not all that great one-to-one -one with most other animals. Like, we lose to a mosquito in a lot of places. Like, we're not that intimidating. We have not survived on the planet because we're stronger or faster or tougher. And I hate to tell you this either, we're not also not the smartest. That belongs at this point to dolphins and whales. Dolphins and whales can project the image of a fish into another dolphin's mind in order to tell them that that fish is around. I can't do that. <laughs> but the way that we have survived, our superpower has been our hive mind, our collective consciousness, meaning that because we have empathy for one another, because we're willing to help somebody out even when it gives us nothing in return, that has meant that we've collaborated century after century after century to protect one another. And that's how we've survived. We don't survive one-on-one, -on -one, we survive as a group. And if you start pulling those little threads apart, you're gonna have trouble. So here we come back to what we have replaced regular conversation with, and that is texting and emailing and social media. Now, the explosion in social media way outstripped the research into its effect on our brains. So some of the research is just now beginning to come in. And here's the thing. Just going off some, some email research that came out just last year from Microsoft, and if you've ever worked with Microsoft, they're the worst anyway. They don't read their own research. They're the worst at email, the worst. But it turns out we're our worst version of ourselves in email. We are our worst version of ourselves. We're less likely to negotiate. We're less likely to cooperate. We're more likely to be rude, and we're more likely to escalate conflict. The research is just beginning to come in on, say, Twitter and social media as well. And it's, it's basically the same. We're not good people. And some other really fascinating research that just came out last fall showed that if we read an opinion we disagree with, and I mean in any format, a regular book, digitally, however it may, when we read it, we're more likely to think that person disagrees with us because they're stupid and they don't know what they're talking about and they don't understand the core issues. If we hear it in their voice, we're more likely to think they disagree with us because they have different perspectives and different experience. In other words, the voice literally humanizes another person. We need to hear their voice to think of them as another human being. And so you can imagine, when we have started to move all of our conversation to digital formats, you can imagine what that's doing to us, right? I mean, you cannot begin to understand why we hate each other. And what's going on, not just in the US, but all over the world. We have stopped humanizing one another, and we have lost empathy for one another. 
Now, one of the ways that you have to have empathy for someone is by actually listening to them. And this is difficult when you're in a position where you're training people, because I'm gonna explain to you why lecturing and educating is the worst, is the enemy of conversation. But let's start with listening. Because listening actually requires energy. Like quite literally, it burns a tiny trace amount of glucose. You are not going to lose any weight listening. <laughs> but I'm just telling you that to let you know that in fact, if you sit there listening to someone in an intense, focused way for any period of time, you'll feel tired. And there's a reason for that. You've burned energy. And so sometimes we avoid it for that very reason. We've worn ourselves out doing other things. And so we can't bring ourselves to listen to someone else. And I get that. But if you can't listen to someone, you have the modern version of conversation, which is this person saying what they know and think, and then this person waits till they stop talking and then says what they know and think, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They don't listen to one another, they don't really respond to one another, they're really just waiting until the other person takes a breath so they can fit in what they've been waiting to say for the past three minutes. And one of the reasons I know this is because they did a study, and I mean it was worldwide. They looked at Mauritania, Japan, all kinds of countries, and what they were looking for was the average amount of time we leave between one person finishing a sentence and another person starting another sentence. Worldwide, the average amount of time is less than half a second. So there's no way we are actually listening to everything the other person says. We're assuming we know the rest and our brains are going, okay, wrap it up, I got something to say. And we stop listening because what we have to say is really good and it's clever, or it's this awesome story about meeting Ellen DeGeneres in a coffee shop. And so we stop listening because we just want to wait until there's a break in the conversation where we can put in what it is that we're going to say. But what ends up happening is the modern version of conversation is a lecture. And even though we're not like, being teachers, now I'm not talking about your training, that's where you literally have to lecture. I'm talking about the conversation part of it. One should never enter a conversation intending to educate somebody, ever. I don't care how dumb you think they are or how wrong you think they are. When you are trying to educate someone, you are quite literally putting yourself on a higher status than they are, which means you won't really listen to them, won't really respect it, and they're gonna feel defensive. So your conversation is over before it begins. Instead, again, flip your script. Go into every conversation assuming that you have something to learn. This is the way Bill Nye says it. But let me tell you something, after nearly 20 years interviewing all kinds of people, from presidents down to kindergarten teachers and sanitation workers, I can tell you this, everyone is an expert in something. Everybody knows something you don't. Everybody is an expert in something, which means there's something they can teach you. And if all you're doing is going to these conversations and educating people, you're missing out on a gigantic wealth of knowledge. You're missing out. Because you will learn nothing from what you say. You know all that already. I mean, Buddha said it a long time ago. He said, if your mouth is open, you're not learning. Even Larry King said it. He said, I will learn nothing from what I say today. I can only learn by listening. But we don't do it anymore. One of the ways that can help you listen really well, and it's a really good discipline, is to ask good questions. Now, a lot of times, unfortunately, the questions that we ask are set up in a way that they um, kind of enhance our own identity. We ask questions in a way that show we either already know the answer, or they show how well informed we are, or we kind of ask such a long, complicated question that in the end it just uh, ends up being a yes or no question, right? We're not giving control of the conversation over, we're retaining control with our question. Whereas if you ask a simple question, who, what, where, when, why, or how, you're saying, okay, now you tell me. Now you tell me what you have to say, and you hand control over. Because this is the thing. A healthy conversation is very much like a game of catch. And a lot of times to these things I'll bring, when I'm doing a workshop anyway, I'll bring a bucket of tennis balls. And I'll have people play a game of catch. Because in a game of catch, you 
literally cannot throw more times than you catch. It has to be an even balance. And more than that, both people have to set the other person up to catch the ball, if it's gonna be fun. I mean, if you're pegging the ball off down the thing, that person's not gonna play with you for very long. It's not fun anymore. But if it's a fun game of catch, you're literally thinking about throwing the ball in a way where they can catch it and return it. And that's the way a conversation needs to go. You're considering the other person all the time. So if I can do anything, <laughs> It's to make you start being aware of how little you let other people tell you what they know and that you actually listen to them instead of assuming that you know what they're going to say. You know, I hear from people all the time complaining about millennials because, of course, they're, they're the iGen, right? They've grown up with smartphones. They're terrible. They can't talk to each other. They're socially awkward. They're stunted. Okay. But I'll tell you this right now, research shows that people over the age of 50 and 60 are worse listeners than millennials are. Because possibly, possibly, somebody who's 50 or 60 years old thinks they've already heard it. And thinks they know what's coming. So when we're gonna, we're gonna go back to email here really quickly, because it's bad. It's a, it's a, scourge <laughs> upon the planet at this point. I want to tell you the things that email does well, because there's four or five of them. Number one, email is really good at sending attachments. Right? Great. It's awesome. I can send War and Peace at the exact same speed I send What Do You Want for Dinner? Email is very good at sending agendas or lists. Here's the things we need for the party. Here's what we're, what we're going to talk about in the meeting. <laughs> Email is very good at sending praise. We have found that people like to go back to those emails in which they were praised and read them over and over again. Email's great for that. Email is really good at sending follow-ups. So for example, let's say that you have something that you need to work out with somebody. So you call them on the phone, <laughs> or you go to their cubicle and see their face, and you dis discuss it, and you talk about it. And then you send an email saying, okay, here's what I think we settled on. Boom. And the person either says, yeah, that's basically it with these two emendations, or they say no, and then you go back and talk to them face to face or voice to voice again. Now I should say for, th for this, in case you're a remote worker, that we found that actually FaceTime or Skype or whatever it is that actually shows your face is pretty much just as effective as the, at this as um, seeing them in person. Just being able to see the human face has the same effect. But I will also say this. One of the big mistakes we make when we actually are on the phone is we try to multitask. How many of you are good at multitasking? Okay, you're afraid to answer, you're afraid to answer, raise your hands. Because you know I'm about to tell you there's no such thing in the human brain. The human brain can't multitask. Now, like 4% of human beings are actually pretty good and passable at switching quickly from one task to another. The number of people who think they're in that 4% <laughs> is pretty high. But let me give you some bad news about multitasking. Number one. The attempt to multitask pumps dopamine into your brain. So when you're trying to do more than one thing at a time, it feels great. <laughs> it feels really good. It feels like you're being very productive. And it also becomes addictive. But with every dopamine high comes a dopamine, yeah. Which means you're going to go home that night and you're going to crash and you're going to be really fatigued way more fatigued than if you had just done one thing at a time. The other thing is, the quality of both tasks that you're trying to do goes down by a minimum of 20 to 25 percent, and your IQ drops by 10 points. Your brain can't do it. You're asking your brain to do something it can't do, and so it short circuits a little. 
Now here's the thing, we have found those exact same results from people who leave their cell phones visible or keep their email clients open on their computers at all time. Why? Because your brain, part of your brain, as long as that is visible, is occupied in thinking about that cell phone. It's on alert. It's like a soldier at the gates of the, of the fort, right? It's waiting so that it's ready if a notification comes in. Same thing if your email client is open all the time. It's waiting, which means again, if you do that, your IQ falls by five to nine points because part of your brain power is occupied in thinking about that phone. And here's another thing that we know. They did a study in Britain in which they asked hundreds of people to come in, strangers, and sit down and have conversations, like 10, 15 minute conversations with the other person. Now in half of those instances, they walked in and they just set a cell phone down on the table. It belonged to neither person. It never made any noise. But the people who had a cell phone present and visible in the room came out and were 67% more likely to say the other person was unfriendly, untrustworthy, unempathetic, and unlikable. So if you go to lunch and you set your cell phone down on the table and you feel great because you don't look at it, what you don't realize is that that phone's presence is having an effect on your brain, it's distracting you, and on their brain, they don't like you. I'm simplifying just a little bit. Just a little. And this is the thing, this is the problem. Look, I, I have no problem with technology. Technology is fantastic. I've got a, a Fitbit, I have a Surface tablet that I love like my own child. I mean, I have every possible piece of technology, but what I have learned is how to use the technology for the things I don't do well and reclaim the things that I, as a human being, do better than any other species or piece of technology on the planet, and that is communication. Now, one little caveat here. Human beings are terrible at listening, just from birth. Okay, so here's the problem. <laughs> if you've ever had a baby, you know that human beings don't come out of the womb knowing how to listen well. We come out of the womb knowing how to scream. And some of us just keep doing that for the rest of our lives. We have to actually learn how to listen. And another thing that we know, I mean, and this is not the fault of technology. Some of this research, the seminal research into listening comes from a guy named Ralph Nichols, who we call the father of listening, and he started his research way back in the 1940s. Here's the thing. When he asked people to listen to someone talk for like 10 minutes, and he said, I'm gonna give you a test, I want you to listen really, really closely. As immediately after they got done listening to that other person, they could only remember about half of what they heard. Within a month, they'd lost another 25%. And after that, it was gone. Which is why when you have annual conferences, you end up talking about the same stuff every year. <laughs> we're, not good at, we're not good listeners. And we have this excellent research out of Australia and New Zealand because they were trying to teach school kids better, in which they discovered that you don't learn, you do not improve your listening skills while you're doing something else. You have to actually take a class in listening in which they say, we're going to now learn how to listen better. And then at the end of the class they say, okay, we learned how to listen better, and that was the only way they saw an improvement in listening. That was it. When it was specifically about learning to listen, not while they were listening to a biology lecture or anything else that was going on. So how many of you had, a, at some point, were offered a public speaking course? Most people are, at some point. How many of you were offered a listening course? Yeah. So like, human beings are really good at speaking, even the introverts. There is zero evidence that introverts are bad at talking, just so you know. <laughs> That's not what introversion is. The secret is we all feel awkward, <laughs> not just introverts. We're all good, pretty good at talking, for the most part. What we're not good at is listening. 
So it always strike me, strikes me as ironic that the one thing we train is the one thing we basically do well pretty naturally. And the one thing we almost never train is the thing that we're terrible at, which is listening. Now, you're not going to leave this ballroom and go out there and be like, I'm going to be a great listener for the rest of my life. That's not what's going to happen. You're going to have to actually work at it and practice. And there are ways that you can do that. If I think everybody got a book, right? Because they're in there. I could go over them, but they're in the book. This is how you learn how to listen better. They're not easy, but they're simple. And you get a little bit better every single day. But one of the ways you do that, one of the best ways you can do that, is go into every conversation and make it your mantra. Okay, I'm going to learn something from this conversation. By the time this is done, I'm going to learn something from this person. And if you do that, think how brilliant you'll be. You'll be like having all these conversations and learning something from every single person. You'll be a genius level person. Not quite. The last thing I want to, well, not the last thing, but another thing I want to talk about is how to keep it brief. So over the past, say, 25 years, <laughs> our attention span has been shrinking. Um, and we can say that's a good thing or a bad thing. You can bemoan how well people used to read longer books than they do now. That's fine. But all I'm going to tell you is that this is what's happening. So on the internet, our attention span when we're surfing on the internet is about eight seconds long. And that's one second shorter than the attention span of a goldfish. In conversation, our attention is maybe 30 to 60 seconds long. Now, one of the things I want you to do when you leave here is find a second hand, an actual clock, <laughs> somewhere, and, and test. See how long 30 seconds is. And keep in mind that that's how long you can keep the attention of the person who's listening to you. And so therefore, out of selfish reasons, if you want them to actually listen to what you're saying and retain it, then you need to speak in 30 to 60 second chunks. And it helps anyway, because I think one of your other speakers talked about this true. You're, the human brain cannot hold more than three or four things in it at any one time. That's it. After that, it just deletes something. It gets up to maybe three or four, and then everything needs to be deleted. So if you're one of those people that goes on and on and on, that's OK. But nobody's going to remember anything that you said. And this also is especially the case among uh, married people. And before you start to blame women, let me just tell you, it's exactly the same when it's a same-sex couple. Someone is going to be upset, and they're going to start reciting every single thing that's upset them that they can remember. And the other person will remember none of that, which means you're not going to get back the response that you want, which means you're going to do it again <laughs> next time you're in a fight, however long it is between fights. So that's another thing is keeping it brief. That's not necessarily the case in emails, although I, I mean, most of us don't. We see a long email, right? And we're like, ugh. <laughs> or I do. <laughs> and, and one last thing I will say about email before I, I move on a little bit is that Probably I talked a little bit about what email does well, but I want to talk to you about one specific thing that email does really, really badly, and that is apologize. You know, one of the most powerful tools that we have is the fMRI, the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging Machine, because it allows us to watch the brain thinking while we're conscious. That was never possible before, and it's only We've only had access to that for a couple decades. Like, it's pretty recent. So one of the things that we know now is the process, the complicated process of getting to forgiveness, of getting to the point where some one person or both people can move on. And it is a relatively complicated process. And I want you to take your right hand and put it at the top of your ear. Now move it up about one inch. Move it back about one inch. That's your empathy center. That's the compassion center of your brain, right there underneath your finger. And when this gets activated, 
that begins this process of forgiveness, that leads you to forgiveness and moving on. When someone reads an apology in any kind of written language, text, email, even at this point, handwritten, this never lights up. Nothing ever happens, which means that complicated process never begins, which means it's as though you never said sorry, which means there will be no forgiveness, there will be no moving on. If you want to say sorry to someone, you have to call them or see them. Now, the reason we avoid that is because that's uncomfortable. We don't like to do it. But see, that's the thing. The discomfort is actually what makes that apology work. Because the other person sees you struggling to apologize, and then suddenly, bing, the compassion center lights up and then you can move on. So if there's one thing I can get you to never do again, is send an apology through email. Just don't waste your time. Now the last thing I'm gonna talk about is the hive mind, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, how much we rely on one another. And to a certain extent, we've kind of thrown a spanner in the works because of Google, which is a very fine search engine, I might add, but it has made us all believe that we're experts in everything. Or we go on Facebook and we read like the first couple paragraphs of an article on merit pay for teachers, and so then we offer our opinion when someone starts asking about it. You don't know anything about merit pay for teachers because you read two paragraphs of an article on Facebook. I just want to break that to you. You don't know anything about healthcare because you read the summation of an article that you saw as it flashed by on Twitter. And that's okay. That's the point. That's how we work. I don't know how to do brain surgery, but I can go find a surgeon who does and get his or her expert opinion. I don't know how to fix my toilet, frankly. How many of you could explain to me exactly how a toilet works? Exactly. Including the reverse osmosis part. Yeah, that's what I thought. We don't need to. You can call a plumber. That's how the hive mind works. We all become experts in something, some people become experts in more than one thing, and then we rely on each other's expertise. We are master communicators because we're supposed to be able to tell someone what we need, find the person that knows more about than anybody else, and then believe them. That's how it works. But it's not how it's working right now. So there's this study that they did recently, and I'm gonna tell it to you because it was the first glimmer of hope I've had. I'm a journalist. This has been a very depressing two years. My whole job is to find the truth and present it to you so you can make up your own mind. So you can imagine if I spend all my time finding the truth for you and I present it and everyone goes, fake news, you can imagine <laughs> how depressing that is. But I finally got a glimmer of hope when I read some of this recent work. So what they did is they went and they asked people, what do you think should be done about the situation in the Ukraine? And then they showed them a picture of Europe and they said, okay, point to Ukraine. Now the worse your geography was, and it was bad because the average person was off by 1,800 miles. The worse your geography was, the more likely you were to recommend military intervention. However, what they found when they replicated that with all kinds of complicated things, including healthcare and merit pay for teachers, what they found was when they then said to them, okay, here's a piece of paper, you explain to me how, if we follow your opinion, how that works. Write it out. How's it gonna work now? And suddenly, they began to doubt their opinion. This is the first crack in confirmation bias we have been able to document, ever. 
I mean, you want to talk about something that is very human. Confirmation bias is very human. In fact, we are the only, hum the only species that suffers from it. Because think about this for a second. Let's say you find a lake, and you t the gazelle there is convinced, believes there are no alligators in the lake. And you present evidence saying, look at this video evidence of all those alligators in the lake. And then look at the alligator scat and footprints. And then the gazelle says, no, 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 no. I truly believe in my heart there are no alligators in that lake. OK, gazelles would be wiped off the face of the planet. We are the only ones that suffer from that because it's not all that great at helping you survive. But what it does do, what it does beautifully, is forces us to rely on each other. Because we don't know everything. And that's a good thing. Confirmation is strong, bias is strong in this one, out of one. So the fact that we've actually been able to find a crack in confirmation bias is a fabulous thing. And before I end, I want to show you my absolute favorite slide of all time. I love this slide. <laughs> OK, so this is this research at Princeton. I'm going to get really geeked out about this. What they did was they had one person, they had everyone hooked up to fMRIs, they had one person tell a story about their own life, just something that happened in their lives. And then they had everyone else listening in an engaged way, focusing. And what they found was that as this person continued to tell their story, the brain waves of the speaker and the listener moved in sync. Exact sync. You guys are all looking at me like, I mean, that's freaking amazing. <laughs> that is miraculous. In some cases, the sync was so close that the listener would anticipate changes in the speaker's brain by a fraction of a second. That's mind meld. We wouldn't believe it if it were in Star Trek. We have no idea how this works or why. We don't. But we know this is what happens when one human being listens to another human being's human voice. This is what we give up when we send an email or an emoji. <laughs> this. So if nothing else, if nothing else, before you send that email, remember this slide. <laughs> this beautiful, human beings are miraculous slide. And pick up the phone instead. Thanks.